Okay, so that really wasn't very active there. And um, as you will probably suspect, um, that's not how we should be teaching or anything like that. So we need to have an idea of what we're gonna do here and the kinds of things that we might be able to get out of this in terms of using some active learning. And you know, active learning can be used in lecture formats and everything like that. So we're gonna try to examine how we can put it into there, what it is, and what benefits it actually has. So hopefully today, I'll answer these questions for you. What exactly is active learning anyway? Um, we toss this term around a lot, but I'm not sure we know what we're talking about. Um, how about uh, the effects on the brain? Does active learning do anything there? The answer is yes, and we'll see what that is and why, therefore, you might want to consider using it. What can you do to encourage this? And so I'm going to give you a bunch of suggestions that you can do in the classroom while you're teaching, not just what students are doing, but a bunch of other things as well. And, you know, what about lecturing? Is that still okay? That might work. We'll have to see if that can work and we'll check all of that out and see what's going to happen right now. One thing I want you to note uh, as we go through here, I'll put some tags on some activities. Uh, you'll see tags going from easy to harder to expert. And um, basically, if you're gonna do any of these things easy, I'm suggesting it's gonna take you, oh, maybe five to 10 minutes of your time. Um, harder, probably a little longer, maybe 30 minutes to time, and maybe some time to run it. Uh, significant uh, time investment is in the expert category, and uh, that also may require some specific knowledge on your behalf as well. And so that kind of thing might be important. Another thing I'd like you to note, too, is right at the bottom there, we're going to do a, a back channel chat in class today. Conveniently enough, this one's called back channel chat. And so if you want to join, please go to this website right here. It's real simple to log in um, and um, takes just a couple of seconds. And uh, once you're, you can even choose an avatar. They have these little funky avatars that you can use. So go to that back channel chat and uh, we're gonna display this up here shortly to see what's going on and uh, try to get that going for you. So let's have a look at that. And um, I'm just gonna change this here. Make sure that stays on there. And um, I want you to do something for me though. Uh, you saw a slide at the very beginning that I know you were saying, like, what the heck's that doing here? Uh, it's this one. And so my question for you is, what's going on? What is this? What's happening here? I'll tell you a couple of things about it. Uh, first of all, uh, that is Mickey Mouse. Uh, second of all, this was taken at Disneyland. Uh, third, I did not take this shot. <laughs> so what's happening? See if you can figure that out, and what I'd like you to do is try to answer that by, whoops, not doing that. Try to answer that by um, just turning to somebody next to you, chatting for a few seconds. If you want to put it up in the back channel, I'll put it up here. Uh, but I'm going to ask some people to try to tell me what's going on. Some people know what's going on because I've told them about it before, so don't you guys chime in. But for the rest of you, what's going on here? Take a couple of minutes, turn to the person next to you, and see if you can do that kind of thing. <laughs> okay, we got it figured out now? Nobody's posted anything at that particular point. So let's try to see if we can figure out what's going on here. And um, um, I'm waiting for somebody, except Miss Mickey's taking psych classes at UCLA. No, that's not it either. Um, anybody know, have a suggestion for me? What's, what's happening in this? particular shot, then maybe why are we doing it? Anybody? <laughs> I don't sound like the guy in the opening clip. <laughs> uh, Mickey's looking up the psychology of dealing with children, engaging, um, not to scare them, whatever. Okay. And he's an icon, so. Okay, that's not what he's doing. <laughs> that's not what the picture's about, but that's a great idea. I like that, oh. yeah. Ask Mickey to sign the book? Yeah. You're really close on that one. Oh. Really close. So given that, anybody else want to throw in something else? Yeah. <laughs> Mickey's trying to figure out what the heck's going on. OK, cool. Uh, what this is, actually, is this was taken by one of the students in my psychology class. They're on spring break. 
And um, I run this contest over spring break, that is because of the exam coming up. What you've got to do is you've got to take your book with you, take a shot of you with the book wherever you are in the world and bring it back and we'll post them. And um, I offer them a $25 gift certificate for the best shot and it gets voted on. Uh, this was certainly one of the best shots at one time or another, which is good. Uh, here's some others that came in, by the way. <laughs> I don't know. Um, how about this one? Uh, you can see this, like, this was taken in Brazil, and um, I hope that's not for sale there. <laughs> Tromblon, yeah, we can make it there. And for you hockey lovers, <coughs> uh, Don actually signed the book, which was kind of cool, so I like that. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing to do because it's you know, promoting going away and studying. But I'll tell you another thing that it does is that it really builds rapport so that we're doing something that's fun at the same time that you're working on stuff because you've got to do an exam on this material. Students actually love doing this thing. It, it, it's really quite nice. Think about that. Now you can run a contest of a similar kind in whatever class that you happen to be teaching. What exactly is this stuff that we're calling active learning? Um, it's hard to you know, pin, I, I hate definitions because as soon as you define something, there's always exceptions, right? But nonetheless, it's kind of this sort of thing. Students are actively or experientially involved in the learning process. Fantastic. And we know that that kind of thing is going on. Uh, so they're doing something as far as learning is concerned. Students do things and think about the things that they do. Fantastic. What they do is they think it through and they make associations. And this is what Carrie's telling us here, because that seems to be an important thing to get some learning done, to do that kind of activity. And uh, when you have a look at thinking it through and making associations, um, these are the kind of things that they're talking about. And Kerry mentions these. Um, he says, here, the two maxims are think it through, make associations, and then there's a bunch of principles for each one. So I've just, I've just picked out about four. Uh, think it through. Promote deep processing. And what that means is it's beyond the face value. Deep processing is cutting down, looking at associations, what this thing means, what it's connected to. That way you're going to remember it better. And uh, certainly uh, Craig and Lockhart, these are memory researchers who came up with this, say that it actually works. It gives you better memory. Require uh, recall of relevant information. So you've got to come up with something in order to connect it to something. And so we need to be doing that kind of thing. Promote dual coding. OK, dual coding is an interesting idea. A lot of people have talked about it. Uh, what um, uh, is talking about is make sure that we present the material in a variety of ways. When you do that, you actually enhance the memory tags. It gets in faster. It does a lot of connections there. It works very well. Evoke emotion. Oh, you're probably not thinking about that one, but apparently that works too because emotion can be a tag for memory recall, and so it sticks things in in that way. What about um, promoting chunking? Uh, we need to put information together. We need to cluster it. It's not just a laundry list of facts. We need to you know, find a way to put them together, and that works very well. Build on prior associations. Ah, so I got to figure out what this new stuff is and what it means for what I already know. And so I'm going to stick it in there in that kind of way. Present organizational scheme. How is this stuff related? One of the things that students have a tremendous trouble with is how does this stuff all connect together? You know it. You know why you're saying this and this and this in that order. Tell them about it too, because now you can give them something else to hang it on. And that seems to improve memory. And um, those chunks that you've um, elicited there, sequence them into stories. Stories are easy for people to remember. Stories people tell, they think about it. And so it's, oh yeah, I remember this, this, this. And now it's, it's another way of getting that information out. And that works very, very well. These are maxims. I'll just remind you of the first two again. Promote deep processing, require recall, promote dual coding, evoke emotion. And uh, here we're promoting chunking, prior associations, present organizational scheme, sequence those into stories. I want to know how many of those you use. Now, um, Kerry talks about 16 of them. Uh, I just show, shown you eight. Uh, and is there one that you've never used? Would you please then join our back channel and tell me how many you've used, which you've never used. And if you um, don't want to use the back channel, you can use this uh, vintage platform called Treeware. Um, and just write it down on a piece of paper. <laughs> Take a few minutes to do that, and let's see what people are using for active learning. 
For those of you who are logged in, it doesn't take long to post. Okay. We got it? I'm thinking about it? Okay, so of those eight principles, how many use all eight? Fantastic. How many use at least six? Another couple. Four? Okay, I've got about uh, maybe 10 people now. One? Wow. <laughs> well, but, uh, that, that, I didn't think that was like mutually exclusive. One or more? <laughs> oh, okay. That helped, okay. So maybe, maybe we have 25 people, 30 people in the room who are using some of these, and that's kind of the thing that you need to do to think about active learning. We've got to do that stuff. It's not that difficult. Uh, hopefully, I'll show you some ways that we can get that done. Now, whatever active learning is doing, where'd that come from? What happened? It left me. Okay, it's right there now. It's okay. Does it work? Absolutely. If you look at the data on this, you'll find that um, people suggest that all of these active learning principles end up doing something important for you. Um, a meta-analysis by Freeman, uh, 225 studies. Uh, what they looked at is in STEM courses, uh, failure rates dropped from 32% to 21%, which is pretty impressive by comparing active learning to traditional lecturing. Uh, advantages are seen in physics, physiology, any PBL course, uh, things of that sort. Active learning seems to increase student performance, student achievement, and it drops the failure rate. In fact, the National Academy of Sciences in the States uh, said that given that, it's kind of like unethical to not use this stuff, right? Because we could get students doing better, so maybe this can work. Whatever it's doing, it's probably engaging in something in here. It's probably changing something in the brain where, you know, we wire up the brain, something's got to go into there, some kinds of things have to be in there in order for us to get that kind of stuff. So what's going on? Is it going to function in terms of changing anything in the brain? You know that the answer is yes, but let's see exactly what those things are. In order to um, make any changes in brain memory, what you have to do is make neural connections. So here we got a couple of cells called neurons and they're joining together and uh, we're kind of sequencing them in somehow and we're trying to get learning done that way and we're going to have a way to get it done and try to join them up so we remember things better. Um, this is a, it's called a semantic node map. And so many people think that this is what memory is like. You've got a bunch of big nodes and you link all kinds of things to them so that when I therefore try to get stuff out of memory, I just go in and I see all the connected stuff. And you can often, you really sort of think about it as these are these neurons connecting up and doing that kind of thing and giving me all kinds of connections that I might be able to use. Uh, we've all heard of Bloom's taxonomy. There it is on the left-hand side. Interestingly enough, uh, some people have suggested, and I'll show you the, uh, the author in a second, uh, well, actually I'll show it right now, it's Coffer, 2001, uh, that in fact what happens if you use low levels of blooms, understanding and remembering, basically you just shove that inf information through the hippocampus. Okay, hippocampus is involved in you know, memory storage and things like that. If you use higher levels, creating, evaluating and so on, okay, it's got to get through the hippocampus, but it also makes its way to the cortex, where we have all the interesting things that we do, and we start you know, putting all of this stuff together, and it's really good. So we want to make sure we use this higher stuff as much as we can. Low levels, only the hippocampus. You know, only is kind of a, an odd thing to say there, but that's okay. Um, higher levels activate the cortex, areas related to decision making and so on, and uh, that seems to be a good thing that we want to do. And what Koffer suggested is active learning takes advantage of this neurological crosstalk, that stuff's happening, connecting all over the place, and now you're actually getting it in, and it works a whole lot better. Crosstalk can be effective. And in fact, if we have a look at the study by Van Est, uh, here we have some MRI scans of people who are passively listening to something and actively listening. Passively listening, they had to listen to a story. Actively listening, they were told, listen to the story, I'm going to pause every now and then. You have to reflect on what you just heard, and I'm going to ask you some comprehension questions about that. So they go ahead and do that, and um, if you then scan through this and try to see what's going on, uh, you'll find that in passive learning, uh, we have, you know, get some activation here and here. This is kind of language centers, maybe auditory cortex, that kind of thing. 
But in the active situation where they had to think about it a bit more, I got the same stuff going on, but I got a lot of other stuff happening as well. I simply light up more brain areas. So if I need neurological crosstalk, all I have to do is tell you to reflect on it. Think about it for a while, and you will get it, and it should be fine. So we can do that kind of thing. It makes some great sense, and we can get that out there. Many people have seen this before, and you're probably wondering why I'm showing this, but I'll try to explain. Here's the uh, uh, classic inverted U between level of stress and uh, performance on a whole bunch of things. Basically, what I'm showing you here is that if you have a moderate level of stress, you're going to perform better. This, this applies to sports. This applies to anything you do. It applies to learning. You need that moderate level of stress in there. And so moderate stress levels are good for you. So we got to find a way to engage students and get moderate stress levels. How do you do that? How can I induce moderate activation? And there's a bunch of ways that people talk about in doing this. Some of these are really simple. For example, play music. You say, what? People listen to music. It activates their system. They get you know, going a little bit. It gets them thinking sometimes. But it actually increases physiological arousal, which is what I'm trying to do. So you can play music before class. I do this all the time. And uh, I think it's a great way to get class going, get class started, and it does this activation. Uh, does it really help us do anything? Uh, yeah, it actually does a whole lot for us. Uh, let's check out this report and uh, see what's going on here in terms of music. OK, so music does something to the brain. Hey, that, we should have known that all along. But we can do that, and that's a relatively easy thing for you to do. Uh, perhaps um, if you do some unfamiliar music, I know somebody uh, asked what kind of music. Um, I don't think it really matters what kind of music, as long as it's not too discordant. Uh, but unfamiliar music is good. Students have to process it a little bit more. Or if you're really going to take, do an entire set. I play 45 minute sets before my class. So do it, and they, the, the beat count goes from about um, uh, 40 to 50 right up to uh, 150 at the end. So it's kind of a progressive sort of thing. So you can do that kind of stuff. Um, you can also open with a quick discussion or learning activity. Um, that's a little bit harder to do because now you've got to figure it out. You've got to put that into your class, make sure that it works. But basically, you're going to get people thinking about things. If I say, OK, let's start with a discussion now, and everybody's saying, what? What do you mean, start with a discussion? So that's OK. You can do that. But please remember, if you do it, uh, debrief about what's going on. You need to tell people why you're doing that kind of stuff, what's happening there, why you included that. Now, most of the time, um, we are lecturing, of course, and um, not of course, most of the time, uh, a lot of us are in lectures, and uh, we need to be able to do things that are in a lecture mode that will help us get some of this stuff done. And um, here I am in Alumni Hall in this particular shot. Uh, I'm actually teaching to those 1,250 people at that time. And uh, I think there's some things that we can do. Let's have a look at what those might be. Uh, here's. Um, kind of things that you might want to think about. This is from this uh, book by Barclay and Major. I'll pop it up here. Um, really great book. I suggest it to you. It's uh, going to be over at the uh, Center for Teaching and Learning. And uh, check it out. It's got stuff in it, all kinds. Of, matter of fact, I borrowed liberally from this um, as in this talk. So have a look at all of these things. It's really, really worthwhile. Uh, focus, format, supports, climate, and communication. I want to have a look at some of these things because these are things that you can have a look at in class and do something about. Let's start with focus. Focus is all about trying to get the information that you're looking at out there. It's not about the student focus. I'm talking about you. You got to focus and figure out what's happening. And one of the things that focus looks at is this. Uh, that's content. So we got that content. We want to talk about stuff. We want to present that. You all know what that is. Fantastic. And um, you know the material you want to talk about, but what's the best way to structure it? Sometimes you just got it all down, especially if you're doing a new course, new lecture, you got all this stuff. Like, how are you going to structure it? How, 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 how can I do that? And that, of course, can be very difficult uh, with a diverse class. And if you're using diverse methods, you need to figure that out. Structure can matter because good structure actually leads to better learning. OK, if it's not just randomly thrown out there, if these things make sense, Students will actually learn a whole lot better. So what can we do here? I got some suggestions for you. Uh, this one's, I initially had this as easy, but you have to do some stuff with it, so it's a little bit harder. Uh, if you're trying to structure your lecture, uh, please um, do a sticky note diagram. 
Uh, what do I mean by that? Okay, so you take a number of post-it notes, look like this, these are blank. Then you start filling them up with all of the stuff you want to talk about, and they'll look like this. And um, afterwards, when you get all that stuff up there, then what you got to do is organize them into coherent streams. Now I've got my lecture. It's together, and it's in these things that make sense to me. I know what's going on. I can tell students about that. Uh, this is why I'm going from this part to this part, uh, because it's the next logical thing in line. You can do that. It's relatively easy. It's not a problem. Brainstorming. A brainstorming, we used to think about something that we just give everybody out there. Give me all your ideas. You can do it yourself, too. So I want you to brainstorm sometime about these things. Uh, produce as many ideas as possible. Uh, why? Because when you do that, it's going to increase um, both structure and flow, which is something that you want to do in any kind of talk that you give or any lecture you give. You want to have it going that way. Here's a, an easy one uh, so that as you're brainstorming about this particular topic, do the uh, journalist W5 thing, uh, who, what, when, where, why, and uh, that will get you to you know, think about why you're doing these kind of things and put that information in there. There's some harder stuff. Um, one's called a roll storm. And um, that's, okay, I'm going to teach you about this, but what would somebody else say? So I'm teaching um, uh, entrepreneurship, and I'm going to say, like, what would Steve Jobs say about this if he were talking about entrepreneurship? What would um, somebody else say if they were doing this kind of thing? And think about it that way, because it's going to change it. It's going to change how you present that, and it might be a good thing to do. What if? What if the hippocampus gets damaged? Are we going to be able to remember anything? By the way, it's not just you thinking about that. You could also throw that out to the students. If there's no hippocampus there, am I going to be able to have any kind of memory? The answer to that is you'll have long-term memories, but probably terrible short-term, if at all. And so you might not be able to learn new things. So what if this happened? What if Germany won the Second World War? Where would we, you know, what's going on? Those kind of things can be a you know, really interesting thing to do. Uh, here's another harder one, attribute change. So now what I want you to do is think about, okay, um, I'm going to give this lecture. What do I need to know if I'm somebody else, if I'm of a different gender, different sexual orientation, different race? How does my thing come across? How do I give this information? And what might I need to do in order to get that done? It's harder because you need to think about it a bit more, and uh, consequently, uh, these things are going to be more difficult. Boy, people are really weighing in here, which is fantastic. Um, uh, thank you, Kim, with Spotify. Yeah, you can do all kinds of great stuff with Spotify. And uh, inter uh, just as a side note, uh, those lecture um, um, uh, music sets that I do, I post them on Spotify for students as well, so they can go there and get them. But we can do these attribute change. That's fine. We can do these things. It gets us into the role of thinking differently. What about climate? Classrooms feel different to people. Classrooms feel different to you. Classrooms feel different to students. And we need to think about what's going on there and what kinds of things are happening in that particular climate situation. Climate's a lot about motivation. So if I have a particular classroom where I can get you motivated to do things, you're going to come there with an interest in learning. You're going to want to get that done. If you're not motivated, like, why show up at all? And, you know, really. So what can we do about that? What is your learning space like? You know, think about it. Is it welcoming? Is it pleasant? Uh, mine, I try to make as welcoming and pleasant as possible. I play music. I turn the lights down. I get the garbage cans out of the way. So that when students are coming in, you know, it feels like a different setting. Uh, by the way, do students come early? Or do they show up at the last minute or you know, when you're 10 minutes into? My students show up 40 minutes before I start talking. And we sit around and chat about a whole bunch of things and they listen to my music. Do you generate enthusiasm and interest in some fashion? That's really important, by the way, because if you can increase motivation, you got better learning. So I want to generate all that stuff, and I need to do that in order to get students to learn better, and hopefully we can get a lot of that done. Increased motivation, better learning, absolutely fantastic. What can you do? Here's another couple of things. Uh, by the way, I saw uh, something on the back chat a little while ago. Uh, will these slides be available? Yeah, yeah, they will. We'll post them on the uh, TSC website, so you can always get back to them there. Do a lecture preview. Lecture previews um, is where you let students know what the lecture is about. Oh, that's kind of an interesting thing. And that you're excited about it. So you just don't walk in and say, OK, let's open our books and start today. We do something else about what's going on. 
and we get students like focused and into there as well, which is a great thing. It builds a different way of, of what's happening in the classroom. This is more than an outline, by the way, and it's really simple to do. For example, uh, here's one of my slides that is up uh, before class when I'm teaching. Obviously, I'm talking about learning, and there's a bunch of stuff in learning. I've even told you what's coming up next time and what you should actually read, uh, but there's an image in there. Anybody know what that image is? So it's from A Clockwork Orange. And so you're thinking, what the hell is he doing? Like, why have I got a you know, picture of Alex from Clockwork Orange in there? You're thinking about it. Anybody know why Alex from Clockwork Orange is in my learning lecture? That's right, he gets a particular kind of therapy in there that I'm actually gonna talk about later. And so now I haven't said a word and people are thinking about what it is that I'm gonna do. Simple. You can do this with your lecture preview slide. You can also post this on a website, which is very nice, so that students can see that beforehand. Simple to do as well. And by the way, at the end of class, you should talk briefly about what's gonna happen next. So I always close my lectures with, okay, we've done this, we've done this, we've learned about this, but what about this? Think about this, How, what would happen under these circumstances? And we'll deal with that next class. So that you know where I'm going now, it's, and you know that I'm not just gonna walk in and start talking about something you don't know anything about, you know exactly what it'll be about, and I've even told you what pages to look for in the book to find it, so you can do those things. Meet and greet, this is easy. A lot of us do this, and you, you, know, you kind of think, oh, yeah, I'll do this first class, maybe. But you can do it a lot, introduce yourself. People who come into your class, they may not know who you are. I was actually sitting in a class one time, somebody walked up and said, are you the prof for this class? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, they don't know. And so what you gotta do is introduce you, walk around. In my class of 800 over in North Campus building on my first class day, I walk around as much as I can in that 45 minutes and try to say hi to everybody. Or I'll try to get them when they're coming in the door. Introduce yourself, ask them who they are as well, by the way. You wanna know students' names? Hey, ask them, it's easy. You might not, I, I guarantee I do not remember all 800 names. But I probably remember some, and that's probably a good thing. You can engage in small talk. We often talk about music, what's going on, that kind of stuff. It's really, really good. It also makes you a real person. And you think, wow, that's, do I really want to do that? Yeah, you are a real person. You're somebody who not just lives and breathes whatever it is that you're talking about. You've got other stuff going on. A real person is great, increases rapport, leads to higher motivation, and I think that that's a great thing to do. The hook. The hook uh, is something that could be a thing that we use at the beginning, could be something that we use at various different times, but what you're doing with the hook is an, it's, it's an attention-getting device. It seeds engagement because students see this and they think, okay, I got this, I know where we're going now, I get thinking about this, and I can do that hook. It provides a guide to a, uh, to a central message, and it increases interest, by the way, because when I have a hook, it's not just me talking all the time, it's something else happening there. So these things can work very, very well. And um, the kind of hook that you can do is have a quote, for example, on, that might be relevant to the topic. Donda had a quote just before we started today. You think, oh, wow, Einstein was into this as well. And it's, it's interesting because it makes us think about it. And so that could be something that's easy to do. You might start with a story where you bring the elements together for that particular lecture. You know, I was in Walmart the other day and the following thing happened. Why? I mean, I can talk about that. So those are relatively simple to do. They start, they generate interest, and it's probably a good thing. Here's the one that's difficult. Have some video demonstrating important aspects. Um, I'm, I'm listing this as epic, uh, epic. <laughs> listing this as expert. Could be epic too, uh, because you either have to source the video or make it yourself. Uh, so that opening sequence that I had today, I actually constructed that. And so it takes time to do that. Uh, you may have to do some editing, you may have to do things like that to get the information. And so you're gonna have to get engaged in that and it may take you some time. If you're lucky, you'll find a single source and be able to do that. But it's a great thing to do. Every lecture I give starts with video of some kind and it, video is related to the content. Um, a lot of stuff that I use right here. We've seen uh, Clockwork Orange uh, for various different things. I'll use um, uh, Nicholson Cuckoo's Nest, American Sniper, I talk about post-traumatic stress. Rain Man I use to talk about intelligence. Like how can this guy be 
intelligent. How can he do what he does if he has an IQ of 75? We need to think about that, and that's going to lead into all the things I'll talk about in the lecture. Lots of video that you could use. We're also doing communication in one way, shape, or form. We have to be doing that kind of stuff because we're talking to people, we're dealing with people, and we're getting that kind of stuff going, which is good. We are communicators. We have to do that kind of stuff. So what's happening here for communication? Well, it's actually about a lot of stuff. Communication is about uh, what we do, what we say, how we say it, and um, we need to do and pay attention to those things. You need to pay attention to both of these in order to keep the audience. You notice I move around a lot. I'm doing that for two reasons. One, it's so that I don't get tired, and two, it's so that you don't get tired. Because if you have to track me with your eyes, you're going to stay awake. And also, I can talk to people a little bit differently and be closer to them and so on. So I do that kind of stuff. Good communication actually leads to better learning. Harry Murray told us this back in 1983, that if you do that kind of thing, if you engage in all kinds of good nonverbal behavior, students will learn more. They get more from uh, the uh, lesson or whatever it is that you're talking about. It does give us better learning and no questions about it. What do you need to do? First of all, face the audience. I know it seems like a strange thing to say, but you know, you're talking to people out there. You're not talking this way, right? It's kind of, kind of an odd thing. So you gotta face the audience. I'm saying, don't worry about the visuals. It'll show up. It'll be there. You know what it is anyway. So you don't have to watch this and try to read that. You're okay with that. Face the audience and make sure you're doing this. Uh, some people call this the weatherman approach, so that you're, right? You're, you're doing this and you're kind of doing this kind of stuff and you, every now and then you glance back to make sure the visual's there but you're always doing this face forward kind of thing. Modulate your voice. This is something that's absolutely critical for us. That's why you have to wear a mic, by the way. Modulate your voice. Change the tonal pattern. It makes it way more interesting. And uh, lower pitches, by the way, are easier to follow. Uh, my pitch has dropped a little bit today because I actually have a cold right now. Uh, so I'm good, hopefully you can follow me a bit better. But as pitch rises, it's harder and harder to follow. And that's a, that's a problem. It can be a problem for um, female faculty, for example. But the, the idea is like drop your pitch down as much as you can. Uh, the optimal uh, rate of speaking is about 150 words a minute. Slower than that, people fall asleep. Faster than that, they can't follow you. Okay, so it's a moderate speech rate. It tends to work, and there's lots of studies on that. Try to avoid dead air. Dead air is a radio term, and where you know something's happened on the radio, and all of a sudden. The radio signal stops, and in about 20 seconds, if it doesn't come back, people turn the channel. And in class, what they do is they do something else, and you're, they're gone. So you've got to find a way to not have dead air. Don't stop in the middle of lecture, unless you're going to stop and ask questions or get people to think about things. If something goes wrong with your equipment, keep going. The worst thing I think that can happen to you is you're doing something like I'm doing here, and all of a sudden, all of the uh, technology breaks down. Got to think about that. You should be prepared somehow to keep going. The only thing I would suggest that you don't keep going on, and I had this happen in Alumni Hall once, was the audio system failed. I can't talk to 1,200 people without a microphone. I tried it for two minutes and decided, no, it doesn't work. So be thinking about that. Try to keep this dead air stuff out of there if you possibly can. Hey, questioning is important. We need questions. There's probably all kinds of them coming up here, right? And uh, this is good. Oh, two students told me I talked too fast. I was just under 150. You're right. This is good. That's the right place to go. Sometimes when people have trouble tracking you, it's because they're trying to multitask, which you cannot do. OK, and there's tons of evidence to show that. You can't multitask and get that done. So if you're talking 150 words a minute, you're doing fine. We want questions. Questions are good. Why? Questions are an important part of learning, okay? When we teach people in grad school, we tell them, ask questions. And when we teach people in undergrad, we try to get them to do questions. So we want questions done. We need people to do questions, and it's a good thing because what it does is it allows students to test and extend their knowledge. They're getting this information, they're gonna have it, so they should use it as much as they possibly can, and that would be good. By the way, if you ask a question, uh, two, two golden rules that I have is one, Wait for seven seconds before you answer it, at least seven seconds. 
Now, after seven seconds, uh, people will be so nervous that somebody will just blurt out something, it'll be okay. So wait seven seconds, count it behind your back if you need to, that's okay. Uh, the other thing is be specific. Don't ever just say, hey, does anybody have any questions? Because nobody will, they won't say anything. You have to be specific about what it is you want them to give you a question on. And if a student asks, please repeat, because either people didn't hear it, especially in a large class, or it wasn't quite coherent enough and you might have to paraphrase it so that it makes some sense to everybody now. So do those things for your questioning. What can you do? Here's an easy one. Uh, use a question box. I have a question box. Here's my question box right here. And I'll circle it, it's right there. Um, it's, it's a cardboard box, has question marks on it. I tell students, if you have a question and don't get a chance to ask or didn't want to ask in class, write it on a piece of paper, drop it into the question box, I'll have a look at it. And I will answer it next lecture. I always answer them, the, you know, very beginning of next lecture for sure. So students actually do that, and sometimes when they do that, the questions that I get are very, very thoughtful. Like they've taken time to figure out what's going on. So it's good, you get the nice questions in there. Uh, you'll get a lot of questions. I've collected thousands and thousands of them over the year, so many so that I actually wrote a book on it. Um, and so this is a collection of the questions that students have asked me over the years. And um, you know, it's kind of an entertaining little read. So it, it's a fun kind of thing. So you can do a question box. It's easy. Here's another easy one. Pose a question to the students in terms of a daily question. This is something after I show my video and I start talking a little bit at the beginning of class, before I get into any content at all about what we're covering today, I'm gonna to ask them a question based on what I talked about in last class. And so it'll look something like this. Uh, Yom was very frustrated with his brother. Rather than hitting him, he decides to paint a picture of his brother falling from a building. According to Freud, this reflects the defense mechanism of, and I'll tell students the choices are these, you could do this with clickers if you wanted to, by the way. Uh, I tend to just use show of hands to see, and we'll try that right now. Uh, you guys all know the answer to this, right? How many think A? B? C? D? Oh, going for D. How about E? Popular answer seems to be D. Correct answer is, this is sublimation. <laughs> now, it's, I won't go into what that is, but the interesting thing about this is it's a, it's a great time for a learning experience. Now that I see that people didn't understand that, for example, I'll talk about it a little bit more, because you missed that one. And in fact, I might talk about why this is not projection. Most people take projection because they say, yes, yeah, a Freudian term I've heard before, right? <laughs> right, okay, so therefore that's up there. So you can do that, that's easy, included in your, in your PowerPoint slides. Doesn't take much time at all. Here's some harder ones. Uh, have a question discussion on one of the OWL forums. Uh, I have a discussion thing, and it's, it's actually for grades, where I'll post a, an issue that students have to go in and deal with, and what they have to do is actually ask a question about it. And they're graded on the complexity of their question. They do it in small groups of 20 uh, in, the, in an online forum, and then after all the questions are in, they have to answer somebody else's question. And they're also graded on that in terms of complexity and citation and so on. So you can do that, it's easy. You get people to ask questions, they get used to it. And it's something that is very valuable for them. I'm saying it's harder because you gotta figure out those questions, you gotta get your forums going. If you're like me and have 800 people, I've gotta come up with you know, 50 different groups. And uh, yeah, I can randomize, but it doesn't work all the time. But it still is something that you need to do. Um, learning cells. These are great things that you can use as well, a little bit harder. Uh, students um, are given you know, the topic for next lecture. They have to go home and write questions about it. And then you come back, and the very first time in class, you say, okay, uh, you pair up with you, and you pair up. I randomly assign people to pair up. And now what happens is one of you asks the other person one of your questions. And you talk about it for a while. You can do that, and then you can either post your answers in this kind of uh, situation. Uh, you could use clickers to do it. There are many ways to talk about that discussion, but uh, you pair off and actually get involved with the, what those questions are, which were, by the way, student-generated, which is kind of interesting. You can do a gallery tour. This is something that can be kind of interesting as well, and a gallery tour will work in a whole bunch of situations. 
uh, gallery tours, um, in this kind of thing that I have in mind, are where you would come down and uh, say, okay, I've got people t talking questions in various places here in the uh, classroom. Uh, now we're gonna go around and see what you're talking about. So I might walk over here and say, Andy, what kind of question you got for me? And uh, we'll talk about that for a while. And then I might move over here and ask some, you know, get some other stuff. So you just move around and rotate and talk about the kind of questioning that might be going on. Uh, you can do it with all kinds of things. You can do it online. It doesn't have to be about questions. It can be about other work projects that students are doing. It's relatively simple. Well, I've got it as a harder tag simply because you have to spend the time getting it done. And it's going to take some time if you're doing it in class, which is another thing for you to think about. And uh, therefore, you've got to figure out how to slip it in. Go back to those post-it notes. Figure out where it's going to go and why. And I have another question for you guys now. Is it better to take notes by keyboarding or by using pen and paper? And if so, why? I'd like you to post it on the back channel up here if you can. But um, as you're thinking about it, uh, just turn to the person next to you again. Matter, matter of fact, I'm going to say turn to somebody else. Maybe turn around, talk about it for a few seconds, and tell me which one's better and why. If you can post the answer, fantastic. So not exactly complete lecture, not exactly active learning, but it got the job done. And so when we try to consider this topic, uh, mm, let's look at a couple of things here. Uh, lecture actually comes from the Latin uh, lectare, which means to read aloud or to say that which is read. And so of course, lecturing was something that actually was read. So the people who knew the stuff talked about it and everybody else listened. And it was the primary model of information transfer for centuries. Active learning, we've all heard about that and thought about it and talked about it. A relatively new concept, really. Um, been talked about since 1852, but um, didn't really get popularized till the end of the 20th century when people started saying, yeah, well, you, gotta, you gotta do this stuff, you gotta think about this. You gotta use this a little bit more. And so people started thinking about it and they came up with the idea that the lecture actually is dead. Well, is it? Here's against the lecture, and these are from Barclay and Major again. Um, Students are passive learners. Um, if you start lecturing to them all the time, they become very passive. Uh, they often call this the banking model, where the professor's up here and I'm making deposits into your head. And some of them stay, some of them don't, some of them you spend, whatever. But uh, you're passive in that situation. Students have no control over their learning. They're there listening to me do stuff, but they're actually not constructing it, thinking about it, doing those sorts of things, and it's tough. Research indicates that the lecture is not the best approach. There's tons of things to do. Here's that Freeman study again. Uh, here's a couple of people who talk about this stuff all the time. Eric Mazur says it's almost unethical to lecture because we know it doesn't, quote, doesn't work. Um, Nobel laureate uh, Carl Wyman says uh, that uh, lecturing is about effective as bloodletting. <laughs> Sounds pretty dismal. For the lecture, well, students can be active learners in lectures if you let them. And uh, they get a bunch of other skills, by the way. I know you're going to say, yeah, yeah, right. Um, they learn some note-taking skills, which they have to do, and that's fantastic. Um, they learn how to pay attention in these sorts of situations. We have to help them a little bit with it, but they learn those sorts of things. And they learn how to listen when you're dealing with complex issues. And those things might be very valuable as, you know, you're moving along in life and so on. So lecturing can give that for them. Another thing that I would say is in favor is the professor is the expert on this topic, and sometimes it's the time for telling. Sometimes I have to give you that information. Sometimes I need to shove that out. And maybe we can think about it later, but yeah, that can happen, and you need to do that. And uh, the other interesting thing that uh, I've noticed here is the research on uh, active learning is almost entirely based on STEM. Uh, there's hardly any, which is kind of interesting in a way, but there's hardly any in the social sciences. So maybe it's the case that this stuff works really good in any kind of STEM-related area. I don't know about social science, where lecture and discussion is something that we do all the time. The discussion, of course, is active learning. But it's a different model, perhaps. So we need, we need some research here in uh, social science areas. Barclay and Major say, ah, this is a non-issue. What you have to do is put it all together, because in fact, they would say, you've got to have interactive lecturing. 
and it's a non-issue completely. They say, rarely are classes 100% lecture, or rarely are they 100% active learning. We all combine aspects of both into almost everything we do. And um, most profs who lecture include some active learning. Most profs who are active learning profs have to do some kind of telling, and so it's actually in there. And so we're, we're good. We use both. The critical thing then, the real question, is how do each of these, how do we do each of these pedagogical techniques well? Because we need to use them both, and so we should use them as effectively as we possibly can. And that's a really important thing for us to figure out. So what do I want you to do? What's your takeaway messages? You got some of these, and again, these slides will be available so you can have a look at some of those other ones as well. Uh, what can we do? Because I want to affect this thing and try to get it in your head as much as I can. Uh, well, number one. Please use some music in class. You love it, students love it, everybody loves it. If you don't like music, it's okay, but it'll work. Number two, use that lecture preview. It's easy, it's simple. It gives you some direction, some guidance for the students. It's relatively easy for you to put together. I think you should do that. Use dual coding as much as you possibly can. So therefore, have this stuff not just auditory, visual, not just PowerPoint, other stuff. So that students can get all that stuff, and maybe they get a little emotional as well, because remember, emotion works, and a lot of those other things are emotional. Imagine yourself in those lecture seats, because that's a really good thing for you to try to understand. And encourage your students to think and reflect. That's going to get that stuff in there, it's going to make it work, and you need to do all of that kind of stuff in order to change what's going on in your head. One thing I'd like you to note here, here's one of my favorite quotes uh, by a guy named Guy Allen, who's a 3M fellow from Toronto. Um, Teaching is a sacred activity. Its power to affect people's lives positively or negatively is overwhelming. To be a good teacher, you need love, energy, clarity, idealism and realism, something of the spirit and something of the earth. I want you to keep that in mind, but also I want you to join us at the break outside where we're gonna have cake and um, <laughs> Fantastic. We're going to have cake, and, um, but we're celebrating all of the uh, new teaching fellows, all of the teaching award winners. They'll be outside and happy, happy, happy to talk to you. So please go out there during break. Um, I think it'll be a very interesting kind of thing. So active learning, what are you going to be able to do with it and why? Hope you learned something here. Remember, these slides are going to be online, so it'll be fantastic. And um, keep it in mind. And I thank you very much. <laughs>